Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. Our guest today is Felix Bolking. Felix is a senior lecturer and associate professor in modern Chinese and economic political history at the University of Edinburgh. Felix is currently a fellow with the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and is author of the book, No Great Wall, Trade, Tariffs, and Nationalism in Republican China, 1927 to 1945. We're going to move the clock forward and talk about how those historical perspectives may apply to today's trade wars. Felix, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let me ask you about first this concept of uh, a trade war. Mm -hmm. Is war the right metaphor to talk about trade disputes? Well, I'm glad you started with that because that to me really is where the historical lessons of my project um, come are the, at, the, at the most poignant. So if we think about China's trade war with Japan in the 1930s, it's, a tra it's what we would call a trade war at first, and then within the space of a few years, it turns into a real war and mm -hmm. people die. And in, as we know from, for example, the work of Iris Chung, in that conflict, they really die in the most horrible ways. So to me, this whole bellicose vocabulary really is very unhelpful because one thing is a dispute, um, a disagreement about tariff rates and trade balance, and the other thing is a conflict of life and death. So to me, one helpful thing to do in this whole debate would be to employ a more forensic rhetoric, um, a more forensic language, and to say, here is a disagreement, um, but it is not a war, and so let, therefore let us treat, let us deal with it by negotiations, um, and let us try and fix it, but let us never be confused about um, the difference between a disagreement about economic policy and a conflict where people die. There's, a, there's a embedded in what we're discussing now, Felix, is this sort of chicken and the egg notion and that does the language actually incite the situation? So if you're using terminology from warfare, you could actually take what is a, a technical dispute and turn it into a, a hot conflict? Or is it just more of being more respectful about what a real war is versus a disagreement? I think you see both of these things. So again, thinking about the historical precedent here, we have, um, Japanese goods being burned in China in the 1930s. We have uh, imports being um, treated as th being the equivalent of um, an invasion, um, particularly when we're talking of uh, Japanese goods which are smuggled um, into China. Um, we have um, the creation of something that is called the National Products Movement in which Chinese consumers are being exhorted to consume Chinese because that is what a good Chinese person and patriot would do. So there is a lot uh, of um, rhetoric being used um, in um, as a way of mobilizing national resistance. So yes, I think it is absolutely, absolutely possible to um, get from consumption to uh, um, from thinking about consumption to um, thinking about um, um, national interest um, by um, just notching up um, crossing the over into violence from. from Absolutely, yeah. um, you know, we have. Um, you know, if we think, for example, about um, the uh, aggression in this country against um, Japanese um, manufactured um, cars in the that we. So mm -hmm. in the 1980s and 1990s, that is another example of uh, a consumer choice um, and rhetoric about consumer choices turning into actual violence. So I think it is very important to be careful there about the rhetoric. Um, and the other point is this about respect. Um, it seems to me that diplomacy um, works best if um, it's uh, you know, if the emotion is stripped out of it as much as possible. So yes, I think it all absolutely is about that as well. In, in connecting the dots of history, w when you look at the the past and the current situation, in in, a, in any of these situations, at least currently, uh, it, there is a tendency the U.S. sees itself as a victim of unfair Chinese practices mm -hmm. and uh, vice versa. Uh, there's always a victim and a victimizer. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a consistent thread through history? That is a consistent thread, and uh, you'll know that in Chinese, modern Chinese history, this idea of the century of humiliation is a very important a century that runs from um, at the end of the First Opium War in 1842 to the establishment of a communist state in China in 1949. So um, this is a period during which uh, Chinese sovereignty is constrained, um, and it's constrained as a result of external, um, usually military threats against China. So any dispute about um, trade in China 
is also always a dispute about sovereignty. Um, and in any dispute about sovereignty in China, um, memories of a period when um, China's uh, sovereignty was constrained because of the trading interests of other countries um, are never going to be very far from the surface. So really the levels of um, uh, the levels of emotion are going to be fairly high um, on both sides, and that I think is why this is such a perennial conflict. The the, the use of the word humiliation is mm -hmm. a highly charged, highly personal word. Yeah, it's not a yeah. technical trade term. It's not tariff no. or or taxation no. or something no. like that. So, in sorting out these disputes, how much of it is about technicalities, and how much of it is about national pride or something more personal? Right. So. Um, one of the most um, humiliating provisions as far as uh, Chinese nationalists saw it at the time and still see it today during the century of humiliation was the idea that China could not charge um, import tariffs that were higher than 5% of the value of imported goods. Um, and that is in operation until 1929. And getting rid of that clause is one of the first foreign policy achievements of the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek. So the idea that um, an external constraint on trade policy is something that is very humiliating for a sovereign country, is something that is very important um, for um, Chinese policy making. Um, and so basically the idea that um, any foreign country, and particularly a foreign country which was active in constraining China's sovereignty in the 19th century, could now once again uh, come and say, here is something which you must not do. Mm -hmm. and. That, you know, in the Chinese case today, that would be um, importing lots of Chinese uh, goods to the United States. That is basically seen as a reversal to older patterns of behavior. And that is why other levels of um, emotion are running so high. And also we have um, the question here of um, China's place in the world today. There is enormous pride in the People's Republic of China of China's economic transformation. And so, again, to be told by another country that there are aspects to this economic transformation which um, are not acceptable and which have to be changed, that is seen as something that is, is an attack on um, Chinese success. That larger um, narrative looms in the back of any issue. It does. In the background of any issue. Do you, you, you write and speak about the unintended consequences of protectionism. Mm -hmm. and so protectionism starts off sounding like a good idea, protecting your national interests. Where does it have the potential to go wrong? What are these unintended consequences? Mm -hmm. So yes, if we think about the idea of protectionism going uh, all the way back to Friedrich List, um, we have the idea that a country with, uh, which is not yet as industrialized as others should encourage the growth of its own industry by uh, running um, high import tariffs um, to make domestic goods more competitive. Um, the way in which uh, protectionism um, leads to unintended consequences in China in the 1930s is because it turns out that the behavior of Chinese consumers is not always um, as the Chinese government would expect it to be. Concrete example, um, the Chinese government taxes um, imported refined sugar very highly with the aim of protecting uh, the domestic um, refined sugar industry. Um, it turns out that a lot of Chinese consumers want to keep consuming the imported stuff, um, higher quality, um, cheaper price. So therefore, um, they buy smuggled imported sugar. So um, you have, as a result of uh, higher import tariffs, the growth of an illegal economy um, in um, smuggled imported goods. And you also have a loss of political prestige on the part of the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek because it says um, we're going to raise tariffs in order to protect our domestic industries. And with every bit of um, smuggled, refined, um, imported sugar that is consumed in China, Chinese consumers know that here is a government policy that doesn't work and that the nationalist government cannot live up to its promise. So that is what I think of um, as the unintended cost, the growth of an illegal economy, and the um, loss of political prestige. If you had an opportunity to, to uh, brief the negotiators on, on both sides of the equation in the China-US trade dispute, what, what are the most important lessons from history that you would uh, make them aware of that perhaps they're not showing a great awareness of in the current dispute? So a couple, first of all, and we talked about this already, um, 
how useful is this language of a trade the, the whole war? Terminology. Um, so yeah. lesson one, keep it forensic. Um, lesson two, um, think about unintended consequences. So, and think about consumer behavior. In the 1930s, you had um, the consumption of smuggled imported goods. If we wanted to apply that insight about how consumer demand for cheap uh, sugar in the 1930s in China is really um, not flexible, we could ask ourselves, where are American consumers going to get their cheap uh, consumer electronics from? Um, what is it going to mean um, if either um, people can't buy as much cheap stuff as they used to, um, or else if they're going to buy it um, from other sources. So there are mm. always unintended consequences. Think about the cost uh, uh, of a trade war. Um, we have various studies about that, one from the International Institute of Finance, which says that so far um, the cost has uh, been, um, well, it would be um, a cost of $40 billion to US exporters um, on an annualized basis um, because of the retaliatory tariff, uh, tariffs. We have a study from Berkeley which talks about a cost of um, to importers and exporters of $68 billion. So there are enormous consequences. And lastly, um, be very clear about what your goals are. What do you want out of a trade war? Um, is it deliverable? And also, how are you going to know how once you've won. Yeah, do you know, can you accept a victory? The, the, um, any evidence that one side or the other is more aware of these lessons of history? I would say that um, because um, the um, 19th and 20th century history story um, is so central to the PRC's national identity, um, because it really is that that is the central conflict of um, China's 19th and 20, early 20th century history. Um, and in the case of um, the U.S. side, there are just so many other factors to think about. I would say that the um, that the historical consciousness among the negotiators is probably stronger on the PRC side so far. China's rise, and perhaps some might say, <clears throat> current U.S. stumble in international relations. What, what, when you're when you're traveling around, I know you you just recently did some lecturing in Greece on, on this topic. Is that correct? Or? I did not actually. No, where where were you? I know you were somewhere. You did some lecture. I was in Ohio. I was Ohio, Athens, Athens Ohio. Ohio. Yes. I said Athens, yes. Greece. So in the U.S. And well, that's actually better for my my question purposes. Is that what is the level of interest across the country or any place else that you've had back in Edinburgh, of of mm -hmm. sort of trying to figure out what China wants and, and mm -hmm. where China's headed, uh, not just from a historical perspective, but in their current disputes. So one reason why I love working in DC this year is that you don't have to explain to anybody why China is so important. <laughs> and not just in DC, um, when I was uh, giving that seminar in Athens, Ohio, uh, we had a- University room. based? Uh, yes, yep. at the University of Ohio. We had a packed room, 60 people, really good questions. Um, I'll be giving similar talks um, uh, later um, this uh, semester here at the Wilson Center um, and also at the Fairbanks Center at Harvard. China matters a lot and there's um, just a great deal of awareness um, for that um, in this country. Um, what has been interesting to me is that uh, when I wrote this book over the last few years, um, I never thought about the trade war aspect being the most important aspect of it. I basically wrote this as a book about the history of fiscal policy. Um, because trade wars uh, 10 years ago, um, especially trade wars in involving China, seemed something that was really more historical than anything yeah, else. Nobody was saying I love tariffs the way uh, President then, Trump is today. And then I came to this country and all of a sudden I realized that actually um, you know, the greatest interest in my book um, was in the tariff war, um, in the trade war um, and tariff war aspect of it. So it's interesting to me that um, the most interesting part of the book is not what I originally thought it was going to be, but Speaking of unintended consequences. Speaking of unintended <laughs> consequences, yes. Well, thank you. It's, it's fascinating stuff, and I know one of the knocks on Americans uh, is that they can be a bit ahistorical on these matters, so it's a valuable contribution you're making. Thanks, Felix. Thank you very much. And just to pick up that last point, it's amazing how much historical awareness um, there is in this country and in this city and Good at the hear. Wilson Center. The thing that as an outsider, I would observe is that that historical knowledge is not always closest to the sources of power, which is where it needs to be. Mm, very interesting. I, I was said we were going to sign off, but that's too intriguing. Say a little more about that. Um, well, um, if um, you go around this town talking to the historians, the policymakers, a lot of them um, have PhDs in history, whether it's Chinese history, whether it's diplomatic history, whether it's American history.
but there are a lot of people with a great deal of historical awareness um, in this country um, who um, Shut may up have that discussion. Well, who may have worked in state or defense or the White House at one point, but mm -hmm. at the moment they no longer are. So the knowledge is there, um, but is the knowledge Just bring it in to the bear. right place? Yeah, right. F fascinating thought. Thank you very much. Enjoyed Thank you. The discussion. Uh, congratulations uh, on the, the new life for the book, thanks to trade wars. <laughs> <laughs> Unintended consequences. That's Thank right. you for having me. Um, Felix Bulking is our guest. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again for a future episode. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us.